from the nipples. Necessity may be the mother of invention, but the ancient Chinese may just claim to be the father. China holds the patents to what have been known as the four great inventions, paper making, printing, gunpowder, and the compass. But the hardworking Chinese are also responsible for the tea break, with the first cup of being brewed in the country's southwest over 20 centuries ago. Lonely Planet author Elise Quinn steeps herself in the stories behind China's national drop. Tea is what put China on the map, and tea is what brought me to Bulangshan Mountain today. This is where some of the finest poor tea in China is harvested by the Bulang people. Now, the Bulang have been harvesting poor tea, a tea of connoisseurs, for over 1,700 years. So this seemed like the perfect place to start my education. The Bulang people are descended from the Pu, a minority group of ancient China. They were the first people to cultivate, process, and drink tea. The origins of tea were strongly linked to Buddhism, and it was used for medicinal purposes by the monks. The majority of poor tea is produced here in Yunnan province. My guide Echo Lam is going to help me uncover the secrets to this champagne of tea. So you see, uh, all these are tea trees, and then the girls are already plucking tea leaves because now is the season for tea. Wow. We usually plant tea trees. This old man don't plant it; it will become this yellow color because we want tea to be good. Poor tea has much in common with wine. Like wine, tea can be consumed immediately after production, but its taste and characteristics improve with age. It's good, but it tastes just like basil. A tea tree's age also has a strong influence on the flavor of the leaves. <laughs> this is it! Oh, can you guess how old it is? Let's say this one's maybe 100, 200 years old. Oh no, more than 1,000 year old. Oh. More than 1,000 yeah. years? Yeah. You've got to be Very kidding! Very old. No, no. Oh, yes. So it's like a, an aged wine. Yes. <laughs> and so when you're in front of something like this that's a thousand years old, you just want to touch it. So I've never touched anything that's a thousand years old before. The villagers harvest some 40 tons of leaves from this plantation each year. The process is entirely done by hand, from planting to picking to processing. And what's she doing here? It's like roasting. So it takes like around 12 minutes. 12 but it's minutes. already beginning to smell yeah. absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yeah, right, right. This step is very important because if you overdone it or underdo it, um, it will change the quality. All right, so, so what's she doing now? She goes to step two. We say like kneading and rowing to take away the bitterness in the taste. I can't believe the difference now. When we were picking the leaves, it didn't really smell like much. And now yeah, it's like this right, wonderful right, roasted right, right. tea smell. Very it's fantastic. Nice smell. Yeah. The semi-processed poor tea is called mao cha, or rough tea. And it's usually pressed into a traditional tea cake. Han Dynasty traders began pressing tea into cakes to make it easier to carry on horseback. So look at this, it's a beautiful mosaic pattern. It almost looks like art, and it's still hot. <laughs> they were also pressed into decorative shapes and often presented as gifts to emperors and court officials. All right, so we put it in, and oh, flat as a pancake. In modern times, the process has become mechanized. But at this factory, they can still make tea cakes the original way. 
Oh, that looks heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he plays it over the tea kick. Do you see? But he's doing it like the machine, yeah? Oh. It's almost like he's surfing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like surfing yeah, on the tea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to try? Yeah, I want to try. <laughs> Here we go. I'm doing the famous Buar tea. Okay, more, more hip. I need more hip. The quality of Puer tea is judged by its smell, appearance, and taste. I have a chance to taste the tea cake I pressed today during a traditional Chinese tea ceremony. My hostess is Chiu Yuan Ching, and the ceremony she's been performing has been practiced for more than 1,000 years. Everything she's doing is so beautiful here, it's almost choreographed like a ballet, it's unbelievable. Basically, it's like when you're drinking wine, you take it slowly, you swish it around on your palate, and it brings out all the different uh, notes. So when I came to Bulanshang Mountain this morning, I thought tea was just a drink that came in tea bags. But after spending some time with the Bulang villagers, actually picking the tea, seeing thousand-year-old tea trees, and then spending the evening here, it's been an amazing thing, and I will never, ever look at tea the same way again. Fashion may be fickle, but the ancient Chinese had style all stitched up. The discovery of silk catched global demand for the fabric, with Chinese merchants weaving their way across two continents to establish new trade routes. Once considered more precious than gold, silk is still tailored to the luxury market. Lonely Planet author Marika McAdam goes on the hunt for new material. Silk is central to China's fame and fortune, and the water canal town of Suzhou has been spinning this golden stuff for 3,000 years. So I'm here to follow the Yellow Silk Road to find out how this town became the city of silk. Regarded as the birthplace of silk, Suzhou flourished as a major centre for trade and silk production in the 6th century, when the 1800 kilometre Grand Canal linked the city to the rest of China. Traditionally, Suzhou's silk was reserved only for the imperial family, and the city became known for the quality of its weave, earning the title Silk Capital of China. Today, there are hundreds of shops selling silk products. Ni hao. Ni hao. I would like to have something made in silk. Silk prices range from six US dollars per meter to thousands of dollars for unusual and antique pieces. I love it. I really love it. The Chi Pao, a traditional gown with a slender cut, is a popular buy for the locals and many shops here can tailor make the dress and have it ready within 24 hours. I have to choose which cloth. But how do you do that? They're all so beautiful. How about you surprise me? I completely trust you. While Madame Ma gets to work on my gown, I'm heading off for a silk history lesson. Built in 1991, the Suzhou Silk Museum is China's first professional museum documenting the history of silk. Ni hao. My guide today is Zhu Yan, the museum's curator. With the history dating back to almost 4000 BC, silk is considered an integral part of Chinese culture. Legend has it that silk was developed by the wife of the Yellow Emperor, the mythical ancestor of all Han Chinese. According to ancient records, Empress Lei Tzu was drinking tea in her garden when a cocoon fell from a tree into her cup. She pulled the cocoon out to discover a fine thread of silk dangling between her fingers. So the people of Su Zhou must owe her a great debt of gratitude. She's the goddess of silk. Yes, of course. The silk in Su Zhou used to travel all throughout China along the Grand Canal on barges, but then later men on camels took it across the Silk Road all through the Middle East and straight through to the West. The ancient Romans were so in awe of silk that they bought enough of the fabric to threaten their own gold reserves. Despite this, they were unable to steal the secret behind China's lucrative trade. 
The emperors of China were so fiercely protective of their silk trade monopoly that they imposed the death penalty for anyone caught revealing any element of its production. So death penalty doesn't apply anymore. I want to know the secret of silk. The secret is this, the silk worm. They live only 60 days. 60 days, yeah. and yet the silk they make in that time lasts for hundreds of years. Yes. This is the traditional way how they raise silk worm. They put the mulberry leaves in this basket for the silkworm to eat. There are over 500 species of silkworm in the world, but only a few produce wild silk. Chinese silk is produced from a domesticated insect that's now entirely dependent on human care. Can I pick one up while yes, I hurt you one? Yes, you can. Come on. <laughs> the poor guy, he's got no idea what's happening today. Go on. This is my new pet silkworm who I am actually hand feeding which means that I am integral to the silk making process. After 45 days of feeding, silkworms begin to spin their cocoons on this straw matting. Wow, it's hard. I thought it was going to be like cotton wool or something. A cocoon is made of 1,000 meters silk. You mean from this one we would yeah, get yeah. 1,000 1, meters? Yeah. That's a hell of a lot of silk. Check out this ancient ingenuity. This is how they get the silk off the cocoons. They put them in water, they boil it up to make them soft, and then they whisk some of it out, like so, and then out it comes. There you go, they grab it, and then they attach it onto there, and then it gets spun up into one big, long, strong thread from several of them. In China, the art of silk embroidery is admired on the same level as fine painting. Suzhou is known for developing one of the four most respected styles of embroidery in the country. Known as Su embroidery, the craft involves layering different coloured threads in unequal stitches. The Suzhou Silk Institute is considered part of the national heritage and was set up to preserve this ancient art form. So I've been learning today about silk in Suzhou. When did the embroidery start using the silk? Suzhou embroidery has a long history, about 2,000 years. Almost every home woman, every young lady, they all can do the stitch of words. How long does it take to learn how to do this? About five, six years. Because when they come here, uh, they are not only just to learn the different kind of the stitches, they also will learn paintings, how they select the colors. A piece of intricate embroidery can take 12 people more than a year to complete. I don't understand how it looks so perfect and so lifelike. If you look at all these pictures around, they look like paintings or photos, and they're all hand-stitched silk. Yeah, I see. <sighs> it's exactly the same on both sides. And then now I show you another very interesting piece. Charlie! Yeah, the Charlie. <laughs> and then precious. what happens? You can see what happens. No way. It's different on both sides. Yeah. How on earth do you do that? It's like an optical illusion. Only make it on the one piece of material, but uh, the outline it should be the same. Silk has been credited as the product that first brought China to the attention of the world. Today, China produces more than 50% of silk globally, and most of it is exported from here in Suzhou. I can't wait to try this. Ta-da! It's so exciting at the end of my journey on the Silk Road in Suzhou to be standing here in my very own piece of history and innovation. And it took the silkworms and the weavers and the tailors to put me in this fabulous dress. And it makes me feel like a silk empress. Just because they kept their nose to the grindstone doesn't mean that Chinese inventors didn't have their head in the clouds. Aerial innovations such as kites and fireworks created an explosive combination in ancient Chinese military maneuvers defying gravity and enemy expectations. Their popularity has since skyrocketed, used for both sport and symbolism. Lonely Planet author Daniel McCrowan heads off for a cracking good time. But will he come back down to Earth?
Everyone knows paper and gunpowder were great Chinese inventions, but the very first kites and fireworks also came from here. I'm off to Three Stones Kite Shop, one of the few remaining traditional kite making shops in Beijing, to find out a little bit more. The earliest Chinese kites date as far back as the Warring States period, about two millennia ago. In those days, kites were made of wood and used mainly by the military. Some were reportedly large enough to carry grown men up in the air to spy on enemy movements. It wasn't until the Tang Dynasty between the 5th to 8th centuries that kites were redesigned for recreational use. This is Liu Xianxian, right? Hey, I'm Liu. I'm Daniel. Mr. Liu is a fourth generation kite maker who still plies his trade the old fashioned way. This is what? This is a real kite. Ah, okay. It's really, really delicate. With a bit of glue, paint, bamboo, and a large dose of imagination. He's created works of art that are sought after throughout China. His great grandfather used to actually make kites for the emperor. This is one of the biggest kites he has. This is a big dragon kite with a huge long tail. How much is this? Uh, yeah, that's like fifteen hundred dollars. Tiger, that's too expensive. <laughs> Can you maybe help me make one? I uh, could, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now we're have time. Excellent. We're going to make uh, kites. Uh, cool. The first step in making a kite is designing the motif. Mr. Liu prefers to paint on silk, but for beginners like me, it's cheaper to use paper. I'm glad I'm not making this for the emperor. <laughs> Like old Chinese paintings, the motifs on each kite hold a special meaning. Dragons represent power, tortoises are for prosperity, and cranes signal a long life. The frog I'm making is associated with fertility. Can you make? Can you make? Very good. I'm not sure it's that good. The most important part is the shoulder. You have to be perfectly straight. Look. Okay. So this is the most important part of the kite, so that the kite is perfectly symmetrical. Otherwise, it won't fly properly. Choosing the right type of bamboo is important for balancing the kite. Mr. Liu prefers golden bamboo, dried in controlled conditions for over three years, giving it strength and dexterity. Well, what's here, Jagger man? Okay. Our very own frog kite. So I wonder if we can fly this thing. 那个我我在柏林公园约了几个朋友，咱们一起放这个。哎，太好了！哎，老刘。There are almost 300 varieties of kite designs, featuring animals, human figures, mythical beasts, and Chinese symbols. So, so, hey, so, so, so. They can be as small as 30 centimeters across, or have a massive span of up to 300 meters. Hey, 好呀，好呀，好呀，好呀，哎，好。Mr. Liu's humongous dragon kite has taken a small team of artists more than two months to create. But the joy of launching it is worth all the hard work. Why does the tail of this dragon have feathers? If this kite has no feathers, it has to be the same. It has to be the same. It has to be the same. Wow. 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 Let the string out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
is credited with inventing the first firecracker about a thousand years ago. Firecrackers, so you started off here with a, with a lighter. Back then they were made out of bamboo, and people believed they helped fend off evil spirits and that ghosts would be frightened by the loud bangs. The tradition of lighting up these noisemakers for good luck continues today at festive celebrations like weddings and Chinese New Year. Okay, so I've got 40 of these kind of rockets in here. Wow, this is cheap. This is very cheap, $100. So you're talking about $15 for 40 rockets that go 30 meters into the sky. Superb. What was that? Nighttime kite flying has been around since the 7th century, when strings of candle-lit lanterns were mounted on the body and tail of kites. Ultimately, they were a flying fire hazard, and the practice was eventually banned. These days, technology like low-voltage batteries and LED lights has made nighttime kite flying popular again. Hey, hey, whoa, take it out now. This is how you do it. Wow, this is so beautiful. Look at this. Fantastic. Whoa, thank you. This is my little surprise for you. Whoa. How can I? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, uh, tell me how I can. So we've got kites for the lights, we've got fireworks. What a way to finish off a day in Beijing with a bang! <laughs>